Have you ever found a game so unique that you literally cannot compare it to anything else? Because I have. 31. This is the number of how many times I've talked about a specific indie game here on this channel, and none of these games are anything like this game that I have discovered. With only 23 reviews on Steam, this is Battlejuice Alchemist. The initial playthrough of this game was the demo, which I did play on stream, and it was pretty good, with a mix of real-time combat and close encounters, where potions are your weapons. Honestly, pretty unique game overall. The first section of the game is the Mountain Pass, which is where the tutorial is, and after creating your character, that's where the demo starts. Now while finally purchasing the game, we get launched right into Caribou Creek. The demo save carries over to the full game, but it was an outdated character from an older version of the game, so I decided to start over. Bold Swift and Sly Alchemist are classes, and each class changes how you attack in game, as well as give you different perks. As we customize our character, although not gonna lie, I love the look of this character already, it then gives us with an option of campaign versus survivor. Campaign has three acts, and Survivor is locked. And since this game is an early access, meaning only Act 1 is available currently, we're gonna choose campaign. The opening cinematic hypes you up with dark electronic music, the low rumbling voice of the narrator, and the chaos which is shown in the form of a storybook. A town has been destroyed, and they are looking for an alchemist to save them. Somewhere in the wilderness that once was New England, a dark ritual is cast. We immediately start next to Zen, the shopkeeper, who shows us the shop as well as our inventory. Here we have four different flasks that we start off with. Liquid flask restores juice to use other potions, health flask heals, smoke flask is used as a diversion, and frog hop flask makes you jump higher. We have two main slots and three side slots for the potions, and depending on your strategy, you are gonna wanna keep the ones you use the most in the main slots, especially when the main slots have a shorter wait time than the three side slots. Zen then explains what we already heard in the opening, saying how our uncle's lab exploded and that Caribou Creek needs a new alchemist now. She then suggests that we should spar in order to train for future combat encounters, introducing us to close combat, where it looks like turn-based combat, but it's actually stationary real-time combat, where whoever is fastest wins, and it's an easy way to to level up quickly. This is also where you can charge up your attacks to do more damage, but it'll cost you more juice. Now, since it is a sparring session, we don't kill her. But then I wondered, can you? No, because it's non-lethal combat, obviously. After combat, this leads us to leveling up. We have a set amount of points that we can reset at any time that influence our agility, health, juice, and liquid. Starting with 6 points, I choose to put it into everything but health to start. Scrolls are a valuable asset to find information about a quest. While this info isn't always about something present, it will play into future events. This one is an owl, and I guess we'll figure out what that means later. We have our quest log, which gives us optional hints if we feel stuck, as well as lead us in the right direction of where to go next. Since this is an open world game, a log like this comes in handy, especially if you want to play with objectives first in mind. Literally all of these have to do with Zen currently, which is why we probably can't kill her. Cause you know, that would kind of break the game and the progression. Completing these quests grants us XP, an improved liquid flask, and an item to upgrade our flask. Danielle is another person at this camp. 
who is also a shopkeeper and doesn't have much to say. And basically everybody you talk to in the game is a form of shopkeeper that you can just shop with, which is an addition that I actually really do appreciate. I found two interesting things at the spot. One, the music started glitching and playing two tracks at once over top of each other. Early access, am I right? And then these symbols are basically safety havens, so you can literally just camp here and throw poisons. Work smarter, not harder. Which was worth it, cause look at all this loot. In this pile, I found an illegible scripture, where when I show it to Zen, she gives me XP and tells me to do a ritual. Meanwhile, Danielle tells me about Plato, essentially a Frankenstein pet of Alan's, and that we should find Plato. First, we do the ritual. The first looks like a crate, the second, like a small pillar, the third looks like the first, which was a crate, and the fourth looks like the second, a simple pillar. These rituals cast special effects on the player, which in this case doubles the amount of gold I find. We do another one to summon a specific person to help us on our quest, Lord Bishop. The wild hunt started one step in the west of Poseidon's trident. They went two steps to the north, and then one step to the west. The last stop was where they started. Now, in order to do this, we must use the blueprint. These blueprints can be found all across the map and by doing quests, which, if you have the right ingredients, you can use the blueprints to craft new items. In order to summon the bishop, we must craft his insignia, burn three hide, and type in the correct symbols. A man appears, and honestly, whenever a new character appears, I love the initial description it gives under the character portrait. Kuribu Creek is basically the place where you cast a bunch of rituals in order to progress your quest. And I realize this because now I have to do a third ritual according to Lord Bishop. Speaking of Caribou Creek, there are four areas in Act 1. Mountain Pass, which is where the tutorial is held, Caribou Valley, which is this camp, and then the Stone Circle and Cloister Gardens are places we have yet to discover. Devil's Bane is the third ritual we must accomplish. By using the four symbols in the middle of the pentagram, Box, F, B, F, and five intestines, this spawns a demon, who we now must defeat to help Lord Bishop, which grants us XP, items, and progression to the story. In a way, this game is a mystery. The more layers we uncover, the answer for the truth is just buried deeper. This is basically Caribou Creek in a nutshell. By once I met this guy, who knew 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 this guy. Doing the last quest grants you a buddy. Plato, oh, he's so cute. This is a platypus that seems like your pet now because he really doesn't do much else as far as I can tell. Wait, never mind, he freezes enemies. Well, time to go to the stone circle. After defeating a boss, finding the map, which dear goodness, this is a huge map, and traveling through two plots of land, going back and forth between Caribou Creek so I don't lose blueprints, thanks to fast traveling with signs, debating whether or not I want to fight certain enemies, stopping by a safe house in every area since there is at least one you'll be able to find while traveling, finding treasure chests, upgrading flasks to have more powerful attacks, we finally made it to the stone circle. In the stone circle, tower crafting is now enabled. Honestly, not sure exactly what it does. It just shines light as far as I can tell. But according to the tutorial, they protect us at night while fighting enemies who have a shield. This isn't something I see myself using super often due to how expensive it can get, but the option is nice. The stone circle is here on the map, and once we get here, it's pretty vague as to what you have to do besides search around. So in about 12 seconds, I figured out what to do thanks to the breakable tag, which is an optional feature you can turn on and off at your disposal. I didn't even need a hint, which is nice because this game lets you figure it out on your own with a hint available whenever you need it. So gameplay flows really smoothly. I also just now realized that you can equip a pot to further upgrade your character. So that's another thing to look for. Anyway, so I'm supposed to find a leprechaun that appeared from this barrel and he is nowhere to be seen. I reloaded the game and uh, the barrel was gone. I think I have to search the map to find him, but I, I thought he was supposed to come out of the barrel. Well, then the game glitches and I saw every enemy on the map. The hint says he sits in the center area, which is where the safe zone is, so why didn't he spawn? I messaged the Discord server asking if the leprechaun spawns at camp somewhere else on the map or if this was just a glitch of some kind. I know this is an open world survival game, but I am very goal oriented with games like this, so I want to get through all of Act 1, which is currently available with early access. After hours of messaging the Discord server, the developer manually fixed my save file and the leprechaun finally spawned. But 
once we talk to him, he disappears, so we have to find him. Not again. Since we are so good at retrieving things, the leprechaun wants us to find his coins he's lost. After killing some crows, we found some coins, and the leprechaun now summoned Duhan since we helped him out. Now at this point, this seems like a fetch quest game, right? Well, no, actually, because every interaction has a purpose, and each quest completed is us getting closer to saving the town that burned down in the intro. And this fight with Dullahan, since she is angry that we killed her crows, will get us even closer to our main objective. All of a sudden, Plato dislikes the crows. What did they ever do to you? In any case, after calming the crows down, we must venture to find the scroll of the dead using a riddle which I could not find. Now, my only real complaint with this game is that a lot of the basic items seem better than the ones with improved grade ratings. I get more liquid or juice when using the basics, which means that whenever I get a rare one, I'm more inclined to not use it. This game lets you play how you want, which is nice, but personally, the rarer items should incentivize me to use them, but most of the time they don't, despite the rarer items having more stats. Oh, also, I can no longer save the game even though the game says it's saving. So I somehow essentially broke the game, and this probably has to do with the brand new fixed save file, I assume, which means, just like an early access game, this review is also unfinished.